Good morning, and I welcome everyone to the 17th meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee, and I hope colleagues had the opportunity of a short break during summer recess. I once again thank the Broadcasting Office for their work helping organise this meeting. Can I ask everyone to ensure that their mobile phones are in silent, please? Too. Today's main business will be an evidence session on homelessness and COVID-19, but first, at item one, we have consideration of whether to take agenda item three in private. Item three is consideration of evidence heard at today's meeting. As we are meeting remotely, rather than asking whether everyone agrees, I will instead ask if anyone objects. If there is silence, I will assume you are content. Does anyone object? Thank you. I will take that silence as content, and then that is agreed. Item three will be taken in private. Agenda item two is an evidence session on homelessness and COVID-19. Today we will hear about the actions taken by the Scottish Government to tackle homelessness during the pandemic and how we can prevent a return to pre-lockdown levels of homelessness and rough sleeping. And today I welcome Kevin Stewart, Minister for Local Government, Housing and Planning, Janine Kellett, Head of Homelessness and Housing Related Social Security Policy Unit, and Graham Thompson, Supported and Temporary Accommodation Team Leader, Scottish Government. I'm grateful, I'm grateful for you to taking the time to answer our questions today, and in a moment I will invite the Minister to make a short opening statement. But as this is a remote meeting, we are going to be taking questions in a pre-arranged order. Each member will have up to nine minutes to ask their questions and hear answers to them, and I will let you know when you have one minute of your time left. I do aim to enforce this time limit fairly strictly, but if we all follow it, there will be time for supplementary questions at the end. If the Minister invites one of his officials to answer any questions, I would be grateful if he could state this clearly on the record. And once the Minister has made his opening remarks, I will invite members to ask their questions. Please give broadcasting staff a few seconds to operate your microphones before beginning to ask your questions or to provide an answer. And I now invite the Minister to make a short opening statement. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, convener, and thank you very much uh, for the opportunity uh, to join the committee today. Uh, and to provide uh, an update of the work that the Scottish Government and partners have been doing uh, to keep people who were experiencing homelessness uh, and those rough sleeping safe during the course of the pandemic. It has been a, a very difficult few months for everyone, uh, but of course the coronavirus outbreak uh, had significant implications for people experiencing homelessness. Uh, particularly those folks who were rough sleeping, who are already more likely uh, to have chronic health conditions. Uh, and we acted quickly uh, to move people off the streets uh, and into a place of uh, providing over £1.5 million pounds to the third sector organisations in Glasgow and in Edinburgh uh, to fund hotel accommodation uh, and support for people who were rough sleeping, and for people with no recourse to public funds. Uh, as a re result of that, we achieved a rapid and dramatic decrease in the number of people rough sleeping uh, in the areas where it was most concentrated. And I want to take this opportunity uh, to pay tribute to the dedication uh, of so many partner organisations and individuals uh, during this terrible crisis. Uh, and put on record my heartfelt gratitude and appreciation uh, to all those involved in making this happen and keeping people safe. Uh, convener, we also introduced legislation uh, to protect renters from eviction, uh, and we have confirmed our intention uh, to lay regulations uh, which will subject to uh, approval uh, by the Parliament extend those protections to the end of March 2021. We also brought forward plans so that everyone uh, experiencing homelessness has access to suitable quality accommodation. And that is also why the local authorities' rapid rehousing transition plans are a key focus for recovery planning, ensuring rapid rehousing by default is the means of moving people out of temporary accommodation and into settled housing. It is therefore more important than ever uh, that we maintain our hard work and momentum in efforts to tackle homelessness 
and rough sleeping as we come out of the initial emergency period and into our recovery phase. Therefore, I asked John Sparks to reconvene the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group on a short-term basis uh, to make further recommendations on the actions needed to end homelessness in the light of the new crisis. Within weeks, HARSAG delivered its new set of recommendations to me, uh, and we are using uh, these to further develop our recovery plans and build on our Ending Homelessness Together action plan. And I expect to publish an updated action plan uh, next month. The Homelessness Prevention and Strategy Group, which I co-chair uh, with Councillor Eleanor Whittam of COSLA, uh, will help us to drive these plans forward. Uh, that group is united in its vision of a future uh, where people are moved into their own home as soon as possible, where there is no need for night shelters, where we act on early warning signals uh, to get children and young people back on track and avoid routes into homelessness, where women experiencing homelessness have access to gender specialist services, where people are not left destitute by design, and where homelessness duties are discharged in a way that advances equality. Uh, convener, the work of our partners on this strategy group is being supported by Everyone Home. Uh, that is a collective of 27 influential third sector and academic organisations who have come together uh, to support our response to the pande pandemic. Further, uh, through the change team, we are ensuring that people with lived experience are at the very heart of informing our recovery plans. And I do realise that there are challenges ahead uh, of us uh, in the coming months. Our plans are extremely ambitious, uh, but ambitious is what, what we must be uh, to tackle and to end homelessness. And I know that if we work together uh, to embrace this opportunity, uh, we can help to ensure people experiencing homelessness or those at risk will be supported towards a better future. Um, thank you very much, convener, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you, Minister, for the statement. I will uh, start off the questions by you mentioning you mentioned uh, in your statement the uh, no recourse to public funds. Now, what impact does that have on your ability to do what you'd like to do once we come out of this pandemic? And also. The last report we got was you, by the 12th of July, you hadn't received a response from the UK government. Have things changed there? Are you now in correspondence, or where are we with that? Uh, first of all, convener, I should say that we have been in constant correspondence uh, and communication with the UK government on the no recourse to public funds issue. I have to say that um, uh, no recourse to public funds uh, will be the greatest barrier. Uh, in terms of us trying uh, to end homelessness and to end rough sleeping. During the course of the pandemic, um, uh, the no recourse to public funds policies uh, have been put to one side, uh, and we have been able to accommodate people, take them off the streets, uh, and provide them uh, with the services that they require. Uh, and uh, We had hoped as a government uh, that the UK government would look to uh, change the no recourse to public funds policy uh, and to allow us to continue to help these folks rather than to see folk put into destitution, uh, as th is the case. Uh, unfortunately, um, the UK government seem adamant uh, in bringing back in all of the no recourse to public funds policies, uh, which, in my opinion, are completely and utterly inhumane. Um, and you know that means that ourselves. Um, uh, local authorities uh, and stakeholders here in Scotland uh, have to work around uh, those uh, those uh, policies, uh, which is absolutely awful. Um, convener, what surprises me uh, most about all of this that it seemed in questioning uh, just a, a few weeks ago by committee chairs uh, at Westminster 
um, that the Prime Minister did not understand or seem to know anything uh, around about that no recourse to public funds policy. Uh, and he was rightly horrified uh, when he was told what those policies actually meant. However, um, he may have been ha horrified at that committee questioning session, but it seems that his government are absolutely adamant at bringing all of these inhumane p policies uh, back in uh, to course. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions around the, the HARSAG, uh, but just I suppose as a tie into that, the impact of the no recourse to public funding, would that have a knock-on effect on your ability to take forward some of the, the uh, priorities from the HARSAG? Uh, of course, it has a, a, a knock-on uh, effect, convener, and that's why um, uh, folks in HARSAG, including John Sparks, uh, have said that you know the recommendations uh, within uh, the new report are not only for the Scottish government; uh, they're also for the UK government. Um, we will continue to lobby hard, uh, to campaign, uh, and to fight the UK government uh, on uh, the no recourse to public funds policies. I know that stakeholders across the country uh, feel the same way as we do. Um, and really, as I said earlier, this is the biggest barrier that we have uh, in terms of trying to end rough sleeping and to end homelessness here in Scotland. These are inhumane policies. You know, many of the folks uh, who currently have no recourse to public funds have come to live and to work here. Um, who uh, for whatever reason, um, are now on their uppers, uh, and they need help. Uh, and we um, are told that we cannot help them. That is very, very wrong indeed. And I cannot understand any government uh, being as inhumane as the UK government is on this issue. The PM seemed to recognise that. Uh, yet they carry on regardless with this policy. I hope they rethink this, uh, uh, and you know that we can do our level best for everyone, everyone who has chosen to uh, to make Scotland their home. Can I just check? Is on the uppers? Is that an official term? Uh, I don't know if that's an official term. Certainly, a term that my old grandma used to use quite a lot. <laughs> the the. What actions will be implemented as a matter pri a priority, Minister, and what are going to be the financial implications for councils and partners from the, the Homeless and Rough Sleeping Action Group? I, I think in all of this, um, Convener, what we have got to do is to capitalise on uh, the resources that we have already put in, uh, which I have been very much involved in um, in the past wee while. Um, is to persuade uh, local authorities to look very closely at their rapid rehousing transition plans um, uh, 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 as we move forward, uh, and also um, to boost housing first, uh, so that we can move folks out um, of hotel accommodation into permanent accommodation uh, with the right levels of support, um, so that folks do not drift back into uh, rough sleeping. That is extremely important. In doing that, um, we are all going to save a lot of money. Um, it saves spending on crisis. Uh, but beyond that, doing this right actually stops the human cost of not doing this properly. Now, you know, efforts are going on out there. Supreme efforts, uh, in some cases, are going on uh, with third sector partners. And with local authorities in order to get this right. Now, you know, I I I, I know um, that you know there will be impediments in the way to achieving some of this, but now more than ever, uh, we need to work together uh, to ensure that we are doing our level best for people. Uh, the pandemic and the uh, emergency period uh, have been absolutely awful. Uh, but they have given us the opportunity uh, to ensure that we do our level best for folks who were rough sleeping previously. Uh, it has been an, uh, some effort on the part of many 
uh, to get folks in off the streets. We must capitalise on that and try and ensure that we keep people um, safe uh, and off the streets in the future. Uh, and I know um, that everyone, all partners, will do their level best in trying to achieve that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sarah, you want to come in now? And it's good to see the Housing Minister today. Can I first of all draw attention to my register of interest regarding my previous employment at SFHA? Um, I very much welcome the comments you have made, Minister, about the importance of housing first. Um, can you give us an update on how the current plans on how we support people who have been rough sleeping, how the current plans are sustainable, um, and what happens as, as we move into the autumn? Um, my understanding is that certainly in my city there is a, a major challenge in supporting people through the pandemic and what happens with the short term accommodation that they are currently in, for example, in the telecommodation which is not going to be available in the ones to come, and how do we make sure that we have got sufficient amounts of housing to move people into, given the, the crisis we have in the city with, I think it is over a thousand families already in short term temporary accommodation? Um, convener, uh, I thank Ms. Boyack uh, for her question. And uh, you know what I should say from the outset um, is that some folks who have been in hotel accommodation uh, have already uh, moved on uh, to other um, accommodation. Um, and I think that this is extremely important to get across. Uh, what we haven't done in all of this is just move folks into hotels. And just left them there. Uh, during the course of this, the right support has gone in, and uh, where it is uh, possible, uh, after uh, we have delved and found out what folks' needs are, many folks have moved on. Um, convener, if you don't mind, I won't identify hotels, but uh, in uh, Edinburgh, um, there's a very good example where one of the hotels that has been used there uh, has basically become. Uh, all singing, all dancing pub, which has brought services together, together better than probably uh, ever before, uh, which we've got to learn lessons from in itself uh, to ensure that we are getting it right for folks, um, and that when we are moving people on, um, that we are doing it with the appropriate support. Uh, and Miss Boyack is right to point out. Uh, you know that we need to get that right, uh, and it needs to 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 be the right accommodation um, with the right support. And obviously, um, you know, I am very well aware um, of the difficulties uh, that there are um, in uh, sometimes obtaining uh, accommodation in Edinburgh. Uh, that's why you know the government has put so much affordable housing money um, into the capital city. Uh, and that this, uh, Edinburgh has also benefited um, from underspends uh, that have uh, have been uh, uh, unfortunately uh, had by other authorities. Um, but beyond that, we need to look beyond the social sector as well uh, in terms of using everything at our disposal uh, to be able to house folks. So one of the things which I have done um, uh, in recent times. Um, is to provide the resources um, for a pilot project um, with the Cyrenians, with street work, um, and uh, oh gosh, I'm an organisation. I'll come back to that. I beg your pardon. Um, uh, to look at uh, how we can utilise the private rented sector um, in Edinburgh as well, so we, we can maximise. Up out the amount of accommodation um, that we have um, in the capital city. Uh, just so that I get this on the record, it's uh, Streetworks, Cyrenians, and Crisis convener. Uh, and I apologise to Crisis for forgetting them in terms of that pilot. Sarah Boyer. Thank you. I very much welcome the um, cross agency work that has been done. Um, it is fantastic and it is inspiring. I, th I think my concerns remain about the longer term 
transition period. I welcome the comments about private rented sector. We've got a big challenge of short term lets where we've lost permanent housing in the city. So it's it's about how do we get the additional accommodation at scale, given we've already got that housing crisis, not just with homelessness, but also with people, for example, who've experienced domestic violence during the pandemic or families who are in inappropriate accommodation. So while the past investment is welcome, it's I think the challenge, Minister, is just the scale of the crisis. And is there any reassurance you can give us about how to support people with that permanent accommodation at scale that we clearly need, not just in Edinburgh, but in other parts of the country as well? Um, convener, um, I, I think Ms Boyack pointed out uh, the short-term light situation. Um, uh, as I have already um, reported to the committee, uh, we had to pause the short-term let uh, work during the pandemic. Uh, but uh, what I have said um, is that we will ensure uh, that all of the new regulations are in place uh, by the end of March 2021, uh, which was what we previously agreed. Uh, so we're having to fast track that work now after um, that pause, uh, and I think um, you know there may be some opportunity uh, from that, as uh, Ms. Boyack has pointed out. The government itself, in terms of the affordable housing supply program, um, has invested very heavily um, in Edinburgh and across Scotland. Uh, and obviously, we've had pause on that uh, during the course of the pandemic, uh, but we are now very much uh, in the space of moving forward um, in terms of delivery. Uh, we will um, reach that 50,000 home target, affordable home target. Unfortunately, um, that won't be in the time period that we envisaged. Uh, which is uh, very, very unfortunate, but I'm sure that folk understand the reasoning why. Uh, and beyond that, um, as the committee is aware, um, the government uh, has also uh, put in place um, uh, 300 million pounds uh, of money uh, into 2021-22 um, financial year uh, to ensure that increased that that investment. Um, in uh, affordable housing is uh, not paused, uh, and obviously uh, we need to, to look at building on that. Um, as Ms. Boyack knows from our, our previous job, um, uh, you know, folks here in Scotland, stakeholders uh, are very much up uh, for what the government uh, has set out to achieve uh, when it comes to affordable and social housing. Um, and you know, I pay tribute. Um, to the local authorities, to the housing associations, and uh, to the construction industry, um, who have helped us um, uh, to deliver uh, on our ambition um, in Edinburgh and beyond. Uh, and we need to continue that work as we move forward. Thank you, Sarah. You've got one minute left. If you've got a very brief question, and I'll try and get a brief answer. Two brief questions. One, if I can follow up on the short-term lets, and two, very much welcome that commitment to additional social housing. Um, the challenge is getting it in place as quick as possible, given the, the housing crisis we, we do have that predated the pandemic. I look forward to hearing from the Minister on those issues going forward. Okay. Thank uh, very very much. Much. I should also have uh, mentioned, obviously, we are making changes to the unsuitable well uh, to uh, ensure that uh, we uh, are eradicating uh, unsuitable uh, accommodation as we move forward. Uh, and very, very briefly, uh, beyond that, in terms of um, the flexibility around uh, about the affordable housing uh, supply programme, you know, if local authorities uh, want to buy things off the shelf or take. Uh, stock back into um, uh, local authority or housing association control um, at this, this moment. There are flexibilities there to do that. Uh, they need to talk to my officials on the ground uh, around about that. It has to be the right homes um, and the right places, 
uh, but those flexibilities are there as well, and that's maybe something that Edinburgh may want to consider as well as other local authorities. Thank you very Thank much, Mr. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Graham, Graham Simpson. Yeah, um, thanks, convener. Um, I, ju I just want to say before I uh, get into my questions, this is possibly going to be my final uh, meeting as a full member uh, of this committee. Um, should Parliament approve changes next week, um, I may continue as a substitute. Um, but I'd just like to say to all committee members and yourself, convener, it's been an absolute pleasure to serve on this committee. Uh, and also to the minister, um, I've worked very closely with him over the years. We haven't always agreed, but we've all, always had a professional relationship, and I thank him for his help and assistance over the years. Um, so that said, if we can get into the, the questions, um, the minister uh, mentioned the uh, unsuitable accommodation order. Um, and uh, there's been some some uh, some comment that that I've had uh, from from crisis that uh, the wording of that order, which was of course extended uh, to cover all homeless households, the wording should be tightened up. I think the minister will be aware of this. Um, could you say something on that? That's not something that I'm really aware of um, in terms of uh, uh, comments from crisis. You know, I'll go away um, and have a, a look at that, and uh, I'll talk to crisis and maybe to Mr. Simpson uh, around about um, some of the issues there. Um, it may well be um, uh, that I'm just missing something today and uh, not remembering. I can't think of anything off the, the top of my head around about that. Our doing, um, uh, convener, um, is continuing to talk to um, stakeholders around about the unsuitable accommodation order, um, including um, the local authorities as well as third sector partners. Um, I think it would be fair to say um, that some folks were not happy um, around about us bringing in the unsuitable uh, accommodation order um, uh, legislation earlier um, during the course of the emergency period. Um, but I think um, I, I don't think I've explained to, to the committee before, but I've explained to many others um, that we were going to bring in the unsuitable accommodation order um, uh, regs in uh, March 2021. I didn't see the point of bringing in stuff in the emergency period for that to then lapse possibly, uh, and then to bring in a new order uh, in March 2021. That has caused, um, uh, well, folk, I understand that, but the way that we've done it has caused some consternation. Um, and we have put uh, in place a, a group of folk uh, to continue discussions around about um, the unsuitable accommodation order to try and iron out some of the difficulties um, that folk perceive in some cases uh, there to be. And what I would say to um, Mr. Simpson uh, is I will look at what crisis have said, uh, and you know we can have uh, the further discussions with that unsuitable accommodation order group uh, and see if there's a, a way that we can come to agreement to to try and make uh, everyone as happy as possible. Yeah, um, that that's okay. I think this relates to the everyone home. Uh, collective, and there have been some comments on the on the wording of the order. I'm happy to send a briefing to the minister, which explains uh, their concerns, uh, rather than take up time today. So I'll do that as soon as the meeting is finished. Um, if um, if I could ask um, about the uh, extension of the no eviction period, which the, the first minister uh, announced under questioning um, just yesterday. Well, actually, it was a Wednesday. Um, this seems to have caught some people by surprise. Has this has this been discussed um, in your re resilience group, Minister? I, I didn't catch what group Mr. Simpson said there, I think, convener. Yeah, I think you you have a resilience group that meets that you chair. 
Um, convener, there are three resilience groups, uh, local authority, uh, social housing and private rented sector. Um, and uh, I've been meeting with the chairs of those groups, uh, um, which is now uh, moved to, to fortnightly. Um, I don't think it would have come as a surprise um, to those folks um, that we were going to move towards um, extending uh, no evictions uh, policies. Uh, you know, I've uh, said to folks uh, for quite some time uh, that it is likely um, that we would do so. Uh, as the committee is well aware, and as the First Minister uh, pointed out, obviously um, we have to evidence to Parliament uh, the, the reasons uh, for that extension, uh, which we will do, um, because we have been gathering up uh, evidence as we have moved forward. Uh, and I would hope that Parliament would look to that extension. Obviously, um, there are um, some debates around about um, the eviction scenario when it comes to antisocial behaviour um, or to criminality, um, and we will look uh, very carefully um, at what we have gathered, evidence that we have gathered in that front uh, before uh, coming to decisions uh, on those areas um, of the extension. Uh, but I don't think it will, will have come as a surprise uh, to many um, you know, um, that that is the way that we are going to move forward. Okay. Uh, when we uh, introduced this in the emergency legislation, um, I think it was the second, uh, second act, um, there was concern, of course, that by uh, preventing evictions, that would, lead, that would have a knock-on effect on uh, landlords, social and private. Uh, and so you introduced um, a, a loan fund for landlords that they could apply to. Um, what's been the uptake on that fund? Um, uh, can I say, first of all, to, to Mr Simpson, um, around about the uh, issue uh, uh, that crisis have uh, uh, raised, uh, I've just had a message saying that it is a drafting issue of the guidance, um, uh, which uh, we will fix. Um, I, I, I don't know what that drafting issue is, um, but we will fix that. Um, this shows how modern technology can work in these circumstances as well, and that you didn't just need a note slipped slip to you when you're in the committee room. Um, in terms of uh, Mr. Simpson's question um, around about the uh, uh, non-business landlord loan uh, statistics. Uh, from the 5th of May to the 7th of August, um, there were 86, 86 applications received. Uh, of those, uh, 26, 26 of those applications were rejected. Um, there have been 30, 30 uh, loans offered and there are 30 30 loans uh, applications in process. Uh, and the value of the loans paid out so far is £116,124. Thanks for that. Um, so that doesn't sound like a massive uptake. Convener, were you about to give me a uh, given it's your last appearance, I'm happy to give you an extra minute. Oh, you're very generous, convener. <laughs> no, um, okay, I'll just move on to um, a, another another issue then. Um, I've heard uh, in a discussion that I had with Shelter recently that there's been some some suggestion that there's a, a, a rise, possibly just a slight rise, but a, a rise nonetheless in rough sleeping that we're starting to see it creep back. Are you hearing that as well, Minister? What, what we had, um, uh, Convener, um, was a situation uh, where we had reduced the amount of folk 
um, to uh, rough sleeping to a handful. Um, in most cases throughout this, um, the numbers have been less than 30. Uh, that is the highest uh, number that I have heard. What we have since the relaxation of lockdown um, is opportunities uh, for some folk um, to go back to street begging um, and some of their old ways. Uh, however, what I can say to Mr Simpson and to the committee um, is that um, organisations uh, like the Simon community, like Streetworks and others, are continuing to engage with folk to try uh, and get them back inside. Um, you know, the efforts, the supreme efforts um, of uh, some of the groups have been immense. Uh, and I'll be honest with you, um, convener. You know, some of the folks that uh, I have spoken to on a regular basis, uh, who uh, have uh, been rough sleeping sometimes for a very long time, there were folks that I thought that would never go inside. Uh, but the efforts of the frontline teams have been immense, and those efforts continue. There has been some drift. But we are doing our level best to try and get folk to come back in uh, and to move them on uh, into suitable accommodation. Thank you. Uh, can I just put on record uh, my, my thanks to Graham for his uh, his duty while well, he's been on the committee. He's been a very valued committee member. He was on it before I joined. Uh, we haven't agreed on everything. I think that's fair to say, but we've always worked constructively to try and make sure that we get things done. Um, it will be interesting to see who is replacing, and I hope that we have the same sort of working relationship. So, good luck in your new position, Graham. Okay, we now move on to Annabelle. Annabelle Ewing. Thank you, convener. Good morning, and I echo the comments about uh, our colleague uh, Graham Simpson uh, and. Uh, so, yes, we see yet another new member coming. Um, turning to the issues at hand, the minister has uh, talked at some length about uh, the very, very substantial efforts that have been made to uh, tackle homelessness uh, during the initial stages of the pandemic and how successful they, has, they have been. But they have involved absolutely everybody, every agency, government, third sector pulling together, and that has been shown to be so hugely successful. We have heard about the no recourse to public funds banner in the works, and I just wonder, in terms of trying to sustain the excellent work that we have seen in the last months, what impact the minister feels that the UK government's social security cuts uh, will have on efforts to uh, seek to ensure that we are <clears throat> maintaining the position that we have managed to uh, achieve over the last month. In convener, um, I, I think that the impact of social security cuts are immense. Um, the no recourse to public funds uh, policy, um, as I said earlier, I think is one of the uh, biggest barriers uh, that we have in terms of ending rough sleeping um, here in Scotland. Um, during the course of, uh, of the pandemic, I have taken part in um, uh, calls with UK ministers around about um, some of the issues that we have faced, you know, and, and some of uh, the, the things that have happened. Um, have been beneficial, uh, but many of the things that they have put into play are short term. So, for example, if we look at changes that were made to uh, local housing allowance, uh, that meant that we could utilise uh, more housing in the private rented sector in many places um, in Scotland, particularly in Edinburgh. Uh, but we have got no guarantee. Um, that that's going to be a permanent fixture, and they may move back to the default position on that, which uh, would cause us 
um, a, a lot of grief, um, particularly in cities um, like Edinburgh. Obviously, um, you know the no recourse to public funds uh, scenario. Uh, we have uh, provided uh, over the piece um, during the pandemic some six hundred thousand pounds. Uh, to ensure that uh, people with no recourse to public funds um, in Glasgow and Edinburgh um, have been provided with um, suitable um, hotel accommodation. Uh, we have also provided uh, an additional £275,000 uh, to support the basic needs of, of, of these folks uh, during the emergency period. Those are monies that we wouldn't be, have been able uh, to, to hand out if there hadn't been the relaxation, uh, and we will go back to that default position uh, of not being able to help people who are destitute. Destitute. Um, that, without doubt, um, is inhumane, uh, and that's why the UK government needs to change its mind on this um, and to, to come to some kind of reality. Um, and allow us uh, to help people uh, in need. Uh, and while you know the first uh, emergency um, period um, is over, you know we are seeing uh, situations uh, where um, local lockdowns are coming into play, um, where the virus um, is um, uh, spreading again. I'm, I'm sitting. Uh, in a back bedroom here in, in Aberdeen, uh, convener, uh, during the course of a local lockdown, are, are the UK government uh, truly saying that when these things happen, that we are unable to help those folks who, have, who they deem to have no recourse to public funds? Because quite frankly, if that is what they are doing, then that is putting everyone um, at risk. Um, as we move forward, so they need to have a massive rethink. The Prime Minister needs to uh, think again, um, reflect on what he said at the uh, UK the Westminster Committee Conveners meeting a while back, where he seemed to uh, be unable to comprehend such a policy and get rid of it. I thank the minister. For his answer, I mean, the minister talked about the need for UK government ministers to accept reality. I, I suspect, given you have got many senior UK uh, cabinet secretary uh, who think that it's wise to drive around for 30 minutes to test your eyesight, I suggest that reality and the UK government not necessarily so closely intertwined. Turning uh, in the last few minutes that I have to another issue, I'm well aware of the importance of the Council's policies at the moment of directing their focus uh, in the COVID period to homelessness cases and to those involving domestic abuse. I also, of course, have other constituents who are desperate to, to move to a different Council House in terms of circumstances changing, families expanding, or a whole host actually of, of reasons. And uh, as far as I understand it at the moment, five Council have paused their general council housing app, uh, application process. And I just wonder if the Minister has more information about the generality of the position in Scotland on that, and when we might see uh, a shift towards looking also at the position of uh, many constituents of mine who have been in touch week, on, uh, week in, week out on that issue. Um, convener, I think uh, yeah. I, I would uh, pay tribute to, to, to local authorities and to um, housing associations uh, for uh, dealing uh, with allocations, um, uh, some of which had to, uh, of course, have uh, the worst of the lockdown. Um, in particular, um, I would pay tribute to um, South Lanarkshire Council, who uh, seemed to operate uh, above and beyond the call of duty in terms of allocating uh, even at, at the worst periods. Um, and as we move forward, uh, you know, allocations uh, policy has to be looked at very, very carefully. Um, Ms. Ewing is uh, right to point out um, that uh, allocations uh, should uh, be focused at those folks who are homeless uh, and dealing um, with 
family breakdown situations um, that have happened during the course of lockdown, uh, and in particular um, in looking uh, at uh, rehousing uh, those uh, folks uh, and families in the main women uh, who have faced uh, domestic abuse. Um, while it is uh, not uh, in, uh, in my gift uh, to uh, set allocations policies, my expectation uh, would be that uh, local authorities um, and uh, RSLs prioritise uh, those folks who find themselves homeless at this moment uh, and those folks who have uh, faced domestic abuse and family um, splits during the course uh, of the lockdown. Um, I recognise um, that, uh, that others uh, may have desperate needs, uh, and that is why I would never say um, that 100 per cent of allocation should go uh, to the groups that I have mentioned, but significant uh, amounts of housing in the short term needs to be allocated for folks who have experienced homelessness, domestic abuse or family breakdown. Thank you, Annabelle. I'm going to move on now. To, no, sorry, sorry. Uh, I'm going to move on now to Andy Whiteman. Andy. Thank you very much indeed, Convener, and welcome, uh, Minister. Um, I've got a few questions. They don't demand long answers, uh, Minister. It's just questions of clarity and fact. On the 29th of March, the First Minister said that the coronavirus legislation, and I quote, will ensure that no one can be evicted from their home during this crisis. First Minister's questions this week, she said that, and I quote, our clear intention is to ensure that nobody is evicted as a result of the crisis that we're living through. Now, the legislation, of course, extends the notice period to six months for most eviction grounds. I have a constituent who has served a notice to quit on 6 July this year, which means they need to be out by 9th January 2021. Now, even if coronavirus legislation is extended until 31st March 2021, that does not indeed mean that they will be evicted from their home during the crisis we're living through, does it not? Extending uh, the notice period uh, a landlord must give, uh, we are ensuring that tenants have time to access available support uh, in the short term, and if necessary, give them time to plan for the longer term, including uh, finding a suitable alternative housing option um, as we recover from the unprecedented crisis. Uh, where uh, a tenant, uh, where a tenant has uh, received. Uh, a notice to, to leave, um, I would urge them to access the advice uh, and the support that is available to them. Uh, and where an application for eviction um, is subsequently uh, made to the tribunal, uh, the Com Coronavirus Scotland Act 2020 also ensures uh, that all private rented sector eviction groups are now discretionary. Uh, previous, previously, um, if a tenant uh, was uh, in more than one month's rent arrears uh, on the day of a tribunal hearing, uh, the granting of that eviction would be mandatory. Uh, however, the changes that we put in place uh, through the emergency legislation, uh, which we are extending, means that an, a tribunal now has discretion to take all matters into account including the impact that COVID-19 uh, has had uh, on the tenant, uh, and this, uh, of course, could result in them refusing the eviction order. It could, but it does not necessarily mean uh, that it uh, will. Um, on the, uh, the first coronavirus legislation report to Parliament in June 2020, um, it was noted that the Scottish Government is developing a process to analyse the immediate impact of the extended notice periods. It said that this analysis will be used to help inform the future assessments of continued necessity of these provisions. Is this a process that has now been concluded? And if so, what are the results of it? Uh, Convener, we are looking at uh, data that we are receiving from a number of sources um, as we move forward, um, and all of that will help us. Uh, in terms of determining how we move forward, uh, and of course, uh, we will uh, report to Parliament uh, on our findings of all of that. Um, in terms of analysis 
Um, I do not have all of that information uh, to my at my fingertips at this moment in time, uh, but I am more than happy uh, to write to the committee uh, with how we are dealing uh, with all of that. Be helpful, thank you, Minister. That would be helpful, Minister. I mean, I, I raise this matter because, of course, HARSAG has been reconvened and has produced a very helpful report on the 14th of July. I understand that the Scottish Government has accepted all the recommendations uh, in principle. Now, recommendation 44 says that there should be no evictions into homelessness from the private or social sector until at least April 2021. Um, but how is this to be achieved, given that there is no guarantee um, that any tenant served with a notice uh, to leave, uh, for example, my constituents who were served on the 9th of July, there is no guarantee uh, that they will not be evicted uh, into homelessness? How, how is this recommendation to be implemented? As Mr. Whiteman uh, rightly points out, the uh, um, government has agreed all of the recommendations in principle. Uh, some of those recommendations uh, are going to be more difficult to implement uh, than others. Um, and the government will out uh, and publish uh, how we are going to respond and deal with each of these recommendations um, at, uh, in, in late autumn. Uh, and we will deal with all of them individually. Um, and as I pointed out in previous questioning, uh, some of these recommendations, of course, are not for us. Uh, but you know, we will have to work through those um, and try uh, and deal uh, with that too. Um, uh, so we will publish at the end of autumn exactly how we move forward in all of those fronts. Thanks very much. I want to raise another issue that's come up in a recent tribunal uh, judgment. Um, I understand that uh, in this particular case, and it's reported in the tribunal judgment, uh, the tenant um, acknowledged that they were uh, in arrears. They accepted a, a notice to leave, and they sought and presented themselves as homeless to their local authority. However, the local authority told them that they could not present as homeless uh, until they actually had. Uh, an uh, eviction order granted by the tribunal, which forced her to contest it, go through to the tribunal and get the order. Is that your understanding of the basis upon which private rented sector tenants should, either as a matter of policy or law, uh, be entitled to present as homeless? I am not aware of the case that Mr Whiteman um, uh, talks about here. Uh, what I will do is go and look and see uh, what exactly was said there um, uh, at the tribunal uh, and look at what um, the tenants were told um, by the local authority. Um, I would expect um, in uh, these situations uh, that logic um, should also come into play um, and not just necessarily uh, guidance uh, when it comes to these kind of situations. Uh, but what I will do um, is uh, I will uh, go and have a look at that particular case, what has happened uh, in that situation, uh, and I will get back to the committee uh, on the point. But beyond that, you know, if there needs to be uh, changes of policy or guidance in some of these things. Uh, then I am more than willing uh, to consider that uh, uh, to ensure um, that local authorities are acting with common sense in order to help people out. Okay, that's very helpful, and I'll endeavour to end the particular judgment. It's not it's not the only judgment um, that makes reference to that. Um, I want to raise a, a question I've raised with the minister before, which is the private rented sector resilience group, um, and why there continues to be no represent representation. Um, from organisations who represent private tenants uh, on it. I understand the Minister, in a written question, a written answer to me, says that Shelter Scotland and Citizens Advice Scotland represent tenants, but of course they, they, they do not. Is it still the Minister's position that it is appropriate that there, there shall be no representatives of private tenants on the private sector resilience group? As I have said uh, to Mr Whiteman in the written answer, um, Shelter Scotland uh, and uh, Citizens Advice Scotland uh, do an absolutely amazing job 
um, in terms of uh, representing the views um, of private rented sector tenants. They are dealing um, with private rented sector tenants on a day and daily basis, uh, and are able uh, to give the views uh, of hundreds, uh, if not thousands, of folk uh, who uh, come uh, with difficulties. Uh, beyond that, um, you know, I, I know for a fact uh, that some of the folks who um, are on that group um, are private rented sector tenants themselves. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Jeremy. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, good morning, Kevina, and good, good morning, Minister. Uh, like my uh, colleague Graham Simpson, uh, this may well be my last committee as well, as I'm. Uh, uh, moving on, and I just wanted to uh, thank you, convener, and the rest of the committee. Um, I haven't been on that long, but I have very much enjoyed my time um, on it, and uh, wish you well uh, for the next few months. Um, Minister, can I also put on record what you said at the start? That I think there has been an amazing job between uh, the third sector local authorities um, around homelessness, and I think it, there's a lot of credit has to go to to everyone involved in that. I suppose my question is a very practical one. Going forward, um, as Sarah Boyack said, into the autumn, clearly none of us want to see rough sleeping. Um, but the likelihood is, is that there will still have to be a night shelter in Edinburgh and Glasgow, um, certainly for a few months' time. How will that work practically? And, and what work is Scottish Government doing around that to help the first to provide that? Um, even if it is only for a short period of time. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I know that uh, Mr. Balfour has been uh, very involved with uh, Bethany uh, over the years, and I pay tribute to uh, him uh, and to Bethany uh, for the efforts that they have made uh, in terms of helping homeless uh, folks uh, over the. Um, I'll be honest with um, Mr. Balfour. Um, I don't like night shelters, um, and I think you know we need to move away uh, from uh, that kind of service delivery. However, I recognise um, you know that in the short term there uh, may well be the need um, for some kind of uh, provision over the winter months. However, that provision uh, has to be uh, very different uh, from what has happened previously, which I think that is something that Bethany um, and the Glasgow City Mission uh, recognise. Um, we cannot have um, the situations that we have uh, had before with people together in close proximity, uh, because basically um, that could act. Um, as a, a petri dish um, for this virus, and uh, we were very lucky um, in the fact that you know we haven't had uh, a huge uh, amount of coronavirus cases uh, in the homeless community, um, although there were scares at the very big beginning um, of the pandemic, as Mr. Belfer um, is very well aware. So we are looking. Um, with partners at what kind of provision um, needs to uh, be put in place um, for this coming winter. I hope that that provision is not utilised to any huge degree, um, but that provision has to be designed um, in a different way um, to ensure um, that we are doing our utmost um, to protect folk. And I know that um, the Glasgow City Mission and Bethany um, are uh, in uh, very positive uh, discussions with my officials uh, around about what the requirements of all of that would be. Can I thank the uh, Minister for his answer? And, and I should just say that I've now uh, come off the board um, of Bethany as of uh, June this year. Um, like the Minister, I don't like night shelters. I wish they weren't there at all. But I do recognise that they are perhaps something that we have to have for a short period of time. Um, as you will be aware, uh, both the night shelters run in Edinburgh and in Glasgow um, have no public funding. 
they are raised by uh, the charities themselves. Um, in these circumstances, would the Minister look at, at least for this year, some kind of funding package to help them uh, change from what they have done in previous years to be able to do uh, this year at least? Uh, convener, um, as I said, uh, we are in discussions uh, with these organisations. We recognise that um, what has to be delivered um, has to be delivered differently um, and at a cost, and we'll consider um, all of that um, as we move forward. Uh, we have uh, a, a job of work at this moment going through with the Glasgow Health and Social Care Partnership uh, with the City of Edinburgh Council. Um, uh, uh, with Bethany and Glasgow City Mission, uh, and we will take on board uh, what all of those folks have to say about this um, um, as we uh, move forward. Um, we will consider funding, but I would point out to uh, Mr Balfour that, of course, in all of this, um, the local authorities uh, have the responsibility, uh, but we will look at that carefully. Thank you, Minister. Okay. Uh, thank you, Convener. I have nothing else. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Before I move on to Kenny, then, can I just uh, reiterate my thanks to Jeremy, uh, as I did to Graham. Uh, he has not been on it as long, but his uh, concise method of questioning has come up with very good answers from ministers uh, in that period he has. So it will be interesting to see who comes on and, and takes the place of, of you two. It all works in the future, and I wish you good luck, whatever you are moving on to. Uh, Kenneth Gibson. Kenneth. Thank you very much, Convener. And I will mourn the imminent departure of Graham Simpson for this committee, who I've seen uh, more as a father figure than a colleague, or perhaps at the very least, a slightly befuddled and bewildered old uncle. Um, can I? Can I? And I also, sorry, I should also uh, wish Jeremy all the best, who, of course, has not been in the committee quite as long, but has made a significant contribution. As well, and I'd like to declare an interest as someone who rents out a private tenancy. Now, um, as someone who also has a tenancy, I, I received this uh, eight-page uh, letter from the minister um, just a, a few days ago, dated 5th of August, called "Supporting Private uh, Rented Tenants During the COVID-19 Pandemic." And I'm just wondering what was it that prompted the minister to actually distribute it, and if it was distributed to every private tenant in Scotland, or, or if not, if he has plans to do so. <coughs> um, convener, it was distributed to uh, all private rented sector tenants in Scotland uh, that we know of um, uh, uh, in order uh, to put across um, uh, exactly uh, what rights folks have uh, and explaining to them uh, where they can access um, help. Um, uh, the letter um, follows on from a letter that was sent to social housing tenants, a communication that was sent to all social housing tenants um, in Scotland from myself. But this one um, it goes further uh, because, as Mr um, Gibson rightly points out, um, there is a huge amount of comprehensive information uh, along with the body of the letter itself. Uh, in order that we get this right. Uh, where did this come from? Um, the idea came from tenants and from the uh, private sector um, resilience group. Um, uh, there were discussions uh, around about the timing uh, of all of this. Um, uh, uh, folks, um, some folks wanted to do some of this earlier, but the reality is we were not going to be able to capture uh, all of the information that we have done. Uh, with the communication that has gone out, um, so I think the timing is uh, is right um, on all of this, um, and I know um, that there has been a lot of interest, um, and already uh, a lot of folk have been accessing uh, help and further information. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I personally think it's invaluable, and I have to say it's also been produced with the cooperation of Public Health Scotland, Citizens Advice Scotland, and Shelter Scotland, so it's a cooperative document. Now, one of the, the, the um, reports that came out recently was a stronger Scottish lifeline in the economic storm. And with regard to tenants, it says that uh, government uh, should be prepared to step in where tenants are independently assessed as unable to pay. 
But in the letter that you've distributed, there's a section on universal credit, and it talks about how to apply for universal credit, which of course is not devolved. So I'm just wondering where you feel the remit of the Scottish Government ends and that of the UK Government begins, and what is being done to ensure that that kind of cooperation is seamless? Because we've heard already from Andy Whiteman and others, for example, about tenants who are in difficulty. So how do we ensure that we don't have that problem, that the tenants don't fall between cracks, so to speak? Uh, one of the reasons for these letters is to try and signpost folk to uh, the help and where they should go if they are in uh, difficulties. Um, and uh, Mr. Gibson, convener, is right to point out um, that the Scottish Government does not control universal credit, does not control um, housing benefit. Um, and you know, we uh, have said from uh, the very beginning that um, folks um, should access um, the UK benefit system if they are um, in difficulties uh, in, uh, uh, with paying rent. And those folks who can pay rent should pay rent uh, during the course uh, of uh, this uh, period. Um, the emergency legislation um, is not a, a rent holiday. Uh, and if you pay rent, you should be paying rent. If you can't, you should be applying uh, for universal credit um, for um, uh, housing benefit. Um, and uh, you know, if if that uh, payment is not enough, um, then you can access discretionary housing payments through local authorities, uh, where um, the Scottish government has added. An extra five million pounds uh, over the piece to deal um, with the emergency that we face. But I would point out that uh, you know the Scottish government cannot mitigate every single aspect of the failings uh, of the UK benefit system. Um, I'm not in charge uh, of the 22 billion, I think it is, uh, that's spent on. Uh, uh, housing benefit in one way, shape, or form in the UK. Uh, I wish I was uh, in control of that because I think we would do things uh, very much differently here in Scotland. But you know, universal credit, housing benefit, um, is how folks should access that, which is unfortunately still uh, under the remit of the UK government. Thank you, Minister. Now, the National um, Residential Landlords Association say that 95% of tenants are continuing to pay their rent as normal before the pandemic. But we have been advised as a committee that uh, the Glasgow and West of Scotland Forum of Housing Associations in the socially rented sector, of course, are suggesting that some tenants are taking the emergency legislation as an, uh, to protect tenants as, from eviction as an opportunity not to pay rents. Do you have any evidence as to whether or not that is indeed the case, or if so, what the scale of it is? And if indeed that is taking place and socially rented landlords are losing money, is the Scottish Government doing anything to help um, uh, socially rented landlords um, with additional funding um, to replace any lost uh, revenue? Um, uh, convener, um, uh, I'm aware of the letter from the Glasgow uh, and West of uh, Scotland Forum. Uh, it will come note as no surprise to the committee that the uh, the forum have uh, written to, to myself um, around about um, these issues. Uh, what we as a government uh, uh, will continue to do um, is to gather the evidence uh, of uh, what uh, is happening out there uh, and look uh, and see uh, what can be done. Um, what I would say, quite simply, um, is to reiterate um, uh, what I said just not minutes ago. Um, people should be paying their rent if they can afford to pay their rent. What we have in terms of the emergency legislation uh, um, the ability for folk to stop paying if they can pay. And if they can't pay, um, they should be uh, getting in touch immediately um, with their landlord. Uh, to uh, see what help can be provided uh, to them, to get the advice required to access uh, the support um, that is out there um, if uh, they are having real difficulties. But if you are in work, 
if your uh, income has not changed, um, you should be paying your rent. Simple as that. Thank you very much. And just one final question, if I may convene, and it's on anti-social behaviour. I mean, when I was a counsellor, in particular, as I was for seven years in Glasgow back in the 1990s, um, uh, probably the most difficult uh, issue I had to deal with was an issue of anti-social uh, tenants. Uh, in those days, uh, the majority were local authority. Of course, things have changed, and it's across all, all, all sectors uh, to, to a greater extent, perhaps, than before in terms of proportions, or the more in other sectors, I should say. Um, what is happening in terms of antisocial behaviour? Is it exactly the same as it was before in terms of scale? Has there been a spike? And what is being done to address antisocial behaviour? Because most tenants um, do not really take any interest in their neighbours in terms of whether they are paying the rent or not. But if people are causing um, difficulties and making their lives a misery, then that's a real issue that, that they want to see tackled. And while I, I, we're all sympathetic in terms of the rent issue, I believe um, I don't know that many of us have great sympathy for people who uh, behave in an antisocial way towards fellow tenants and others. Uh, convener, I think it would be fair to say um, that in certain areas there seems to be. Uh, spike of antisocial behaviour uh, and in some cases real criminality. Um, you know, uh, with lockdown and all of the rest of it, some folks' tolerance levels are low anyway, um, uh, and that's understandable. But I think in, in many cases um, uh, what we have seen is an increase um, in antisocial uh, behaviours. Uh, that um, uh, I have to say has been one of the things that uh, has been at the forefront um, of discussions uh, that I've had with uh, frontline staff uh, from uh, housing and homelessness hubs, who are obviously having to deal with us uh, on a day and daily basis. Um, and you know these behaviours are un uh, unacceptable. Uh, and you know um, as we move forward, we need to look to see. Um, in terms of the extension uh, of provisions, uh, whether we provide extensions in some of these areas or not, um, uh, in order to deal uh, with some of the real difficulties that people and communities are facing uh, because of antisocial tenants. Thank you. Thanks, Camille. Thank you. Thank you, Kenny. Uh, can I just ask on that point, Kevin? Uh, sorry, Minister. Uh, is there the scope for if the police wanted this, thought that the safest way to protect uh, the security of the, the the other residents was to move that family out, is there scope for that there? Because that's a really important issue that uh, that uh, Kenneth Gibson just raised. I, I, I think, uh, convener, it's very difficult for me to talk about mm -hmm. multiple cases. Um, you know, we all, um, I'm sure, within our constituency mailbags. Uh, have cases of antisocial behaviour, uh, where sometimes we think it should be so uh, very easy to deal with a case, uh, but sometimes it's not so easy uh, just to move uh, no, no, the no. Uh, logical way of dealing with it. Um, what I would say to the committee is, in terms of um, the emergency le legislation uh, and the aspects uh, of uh, no eviction, there we did something different anyway. Um, uh, in terms of antisocial behaviour and criminality, um, we need to go and look at all of this, taking account um, of uh, the feedback that we have had around about what we need to do there to get this right for those folks uh, who are suffering uh, because of antisocial behaviour uh, and criminality uh, in their neighbourhoods. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Annabelle, you wanted to come in? Yes, yeah, just briefly. Uh, thank you, Convera. It was just uh, I I don't believe that any of the questions I raised had involved my register of interest uh, declaration, but I, I think I should refer to that uh, to uh, advise the committee yet again, and anybody who's watching that I rent out a flat. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Does anybody have any supplementary questions that'd like to ask? If so, could you make them short? Graham. Yeah, a very quick question. It goes back to the question that uh, uh, Kenny Gibson asked uh, about people not paying rent, um, uh, and the evidence that we got from Glasgow and West of Scotland Forum of Housing Associations. Is it possible for the minister to 
find out it, if if indeed that that is the case across the country and what fi what the figures of unpaid rent might be uh, because if we're extending that um, legislation as we discussed earlier it would be useful to know um uh, convener um you know we are constantly seeking out information um uh, around about all of these issues um i think i said to uh, uh, Mr. Back, you know, we will look at all of the data that we can get our hands on, um, and all of this, and see what we need to do ourselves. Um, I, I would point out, though, that in in some cases, um, you know, the difficulties that there are um, with uh, non-payment of rent um, are uh, ones which predate um, coronavirus. Coronavirus in, and the emergency period um, in a lot of cases. Um, you know, uh, in a call that I had this week, um, you know, a provider uh, was talking of between twelve and fourteen thousand pounds of rent debt. That goes way before um, the emergency period. This is somebody that has not paid rent for a very, very, very long time. You know, and I think we have to um, look at all of this, recognising the fact that some of the difficulties um, that are being uh, told to us by um, social landlords and by private landlords are um, cases which way predate uh, the, the current circumstances that we find ourselves in. Okay, thank you very much. Um, that completes the questions uh, and concludes our evidence session. I'd like to thank the Minister and his officials for taking part. Thank you very much. That concludes the public part of this meeting, and we will resume the meeting in private on Microsoft Teams. I propose we now take a five minute comfort break. And please accept the clerk's meeting request for the private discussion, which will be sent shortly. That, of course, is aimed only at members. Thank you.